with patches on the elbows, he holds some papers. Girls, I've just finished grading your midterms, and it's not good news. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you're gonna have to do some extra credit. <laughs> hey, Dom, what the hell? I'm so sorry about this. Look, dinner's just about ready, and why don't I get you seated in the dining room, and then we'll pour the wine, huh? Moments later in the dining room, Lois opens the dining room door, and we see Peter in a Gestapo uniform. <laughs> All right, new arrivals. There's only one way you're not getting on that train. <laughs> we go to a street at night. Brian's car drives along. Inside the car, Chris is in the front passenger seat. Stewie and Meg sit in the back. Well, we got a few hours to kill. What do you want to do? Let's get something to eat. We don't have any money. Stewie notices something off screen, angle on a pool hall. Brian, pull over there. I'll get us some money. <laughs> Moments later in the pool hall, Stewie stands on a stool next to a pool table holding a pool cue. He talks to a few rough-looking locals. Now, wait. So the white ball has to hit one of the stripy balls? Yes. How many times are you going to ask me that? I don't know. I'm just a baby. All right. So I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and... Um, what, what, what is it you called it? Break. Break. Right. Break. Stewie breaks and the balls fly into the pockets. Oh my god, beginner's luck, huh? <laughs> Later outside the pool hall, we're looking through the car and suddenly Stewie bursts out of the pool hall entrance. He has a wad of cash in his hand. Start the car, start the car, go, 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 go! <laughs> Stewie jumps in the car just as the rough looking locals come out of the pool hall running after him. The car drives off. We've been hustled. Nobody says that anymore. Well, then what would you call it, I Jared? wouldn't comment on it. We were all there. We know what happened. <laughs> Later in the Griffin's living room, Peter and Lois sit on the couch with Naomi and Dale. And so I went into corporate finance, and that's where I met Dale. <laughs> Six months later, I was asking her to marry me. What took me so long, right? <laughs> <laughs> they all share a laugh. <laughs> all right, we're running out of time. Are we going to get this orgy started or what? What? We are running out of time. <laughs> Are we going to get this orgy started, or what? Oh my god, you thought that's what we were here for? You're not? No. Well, what are you doing here? Well, Dale and I found out we can't have children. We've conceived many times, but for some reason the eggs won't attach. It was suggested that I find a healthy woman who would consider carrying our child to term, and, well, Lois, that's why we're here. We were wondering if you would be our surrogate. Oh my God, you want me to carry your child? Yes. What? Joe enters wearing only the tearaway panties. <laughs> All right, Peter, I don't know what this is about, but you're my best friend and I'd like to think you'd do the same for me. <laughs> he tears them away and that is the end of act one. <laughs> We're at the Griffin's house at night. Inside the Griffin's living room, Peter, Lois, Naomi, and Dale are there as we left them. Wait a minute, so you guys can't have a baby? Uh, unfortunately, no. Well, whose fault is it? I mean, which, which one of you has the thing that's horribly wrong with him? Is it you, Naomi? You got a bad cervix? Peter, it's nobody's fault. Conception is complicated. It's you, isn't it? You got a bum dong. <laughs> <laughs> Will you help us, Lois? Well, I'm honored that you would think to ask me, Naomi. I I'm, I'm gonna have to think about it. I mean, this is a life-altering choice, you know? It's like an Italian choosing to get glasses. We cut away to an eye doctor. An optometrist wearing a white lab coat stands in front of an Italian guy who sits in an examining chair covering one eye. Okay, read the third row down, please. A, A, O, A, O, O, A. In the Griffin's house the next morning, in the kitchen, the family is there eating breakfast. Everyone, I have something to say. Now, I've given this long and careful thought, and I've decided to carry Naomi and Dale's child for them. You what? That's right. And I want your blessing, Peter. You'll have my stool in your eye, and that's all you'll get. You can't have that baby. Yeah, Mom, you get crazy when you're pregnant. We flash back to the Griffin's living room. Lois and Peter are sitting on the couch. Chris enters. Mom, I can't find my jacket. Lois starts to laugh. Her laugh descends into a sobbing cry. <laughs> Peter, take off that belt! The horrible buckle smells like acid! Lois covers her mouth with her hand and throws up into it. She then continues bawling, looking at the throw-up in her hand and showing her hand to Peter and Chris as she bawls with a how-could-this-have-happened look. Back in the Griffin's kitchen in the morning. Look, I know it's an inconvenience, but it's a wonderful gift to be able to give someone, so 
I am going through with it. Well, I support you, Lois. I think it's great what you're doing. Yeah, it's great. You're treating your vagina like a red roof inn. <laughs> That's not how it is, Stewie. She's doing something wonderful for a couple who can't have their own children and are too egotistical to adopt. <laughs> right there, that's our Emmy right there. <laughs> <laughs> that dude's a deciding vote, we're set. <laughs> you know what's interesting about Lois's vagina, Brian? Everyone in this room has been in there except for you. <laughs> You're the only one who doesn't know what it looks like. <laughs> Lois, I don't want you walking around all pregnant for nine months just to hand the thing over when it comes out like a hen to a farmer. I mean, why's it gotta be you? Because they need a healthy female body to carry the baby. I can do it. Come on, Meg. It was hard enough on your body when you gave birth to Stewie. What? <laughs> I'm just joking. I... Uh, not cool. But really, Meg? I mean, you don't know anything about this stuff. You've never even had a boyfriend. I have, too. Remember that winter I spent in Greenland? We flash back to Greenland, it is completely dark. <laughs> I had a great winter with you, Mag. <laughs> Me too, Lars. Gosh, I can't believe it's almost spring. Suddenly, the sun pops up and we see Lars and Meg sitting next to each other on a park bench. Ugh. Yep. <laughs> back in the Griffin's living room. Well, all right then, it's settled. I'm gonna do this. No, you're not, Lois. I'm sorry, but I forbid it. Uh oh and I'm sorry, I'm supposed to blindly just go along with everything you decide for the both of us? Yes, Lois, that's how we coexist. Just like I coexist with a tiny race of people who live in our carpet. <laughs> we flash back to the Griffin's living room. Peter and Chris are on the couch. Peter eats from a jar of peanuts. Chris reacts as we hear the faint sound of music. Dad, <laughs> what's that? I think I hear music. Oh, that's the little people, Chris. They're playing music so that I will bless them with food. Peter takes a single peanut from the jar and flips it down into the shag carpet. From the floor, we hear the faint roar of an appreciative crowd. Peter smiles, satisfied. The next day in the hospital in Dr. Hartman's office, Dr. Hartman is there with Lois, Naomi, and Dale. Lois sits on an examining table wearing a hospital gown. Lois, Dale and I just want to thank you again. Y you're making us so happy. Well, I just wish my husband felt the same way you do, but you know what? He's just gonna have to accept it. Now, Mrs. Griffin, you should understand, a procedure like this is not without its risks. For example, here's what happened when we fertilized an egg from Shelley Duvall with a sperm from James Blunt. <laughs> Dr. Hartman holds up a picture. We see a baby with a tiny head and hideous, bulging, fly-like eyes that are 10 times the size of its body. Here's Hillary Swank and Gary Busey. <laughs> We see another baby that has only two feet and very small eyes surrounded by a gigantic set of huge white teeth. Florence Griffith Joyner and Stephen Hawking. We see a third baby with one small wheel sticking out of it with a crippled hand and one very muscular black leg. Okay, I think that's enough. All right, so the eggs have already been fertilized by means of intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And now the embryos will be inserted. Dr. Hartman closes the curtain, obscuring him and Lois from the others. Cut to behind the curtain where we see Lois in stirrups. The insertion procedure will be performed by these South American Hovitos blowgunners. We widen to reveal native warriors with blowguns. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. I, I don't want them shooting things into my vagina. Well, perhaps you could tell them. If only you spoke Hovitos. <laughs> The blowgunners blow their blowguns, cut to the outside of the curtains, we hear Lois scream. The next day at the Griffin's house in Peter and Lois's bedroom, Lois takes out a home pregnancy test, opens it up, and goes into the bathroom. At the same time in the Griffin's kitchen, Brian and Peter sit drinking coffee. Can't believe she went ahead and did it, after I specifically told her how I felt. Well, clearly she believed it was within her right to... Brian looks up and sniffs. Lois just peed on something. Suddenly, Quagmire pops up in the kitchen window. Hey, Brian, you picking up on that? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Quagmire disappears. It worked, everybody! I'm pregnant! Damn it! This has gone too far. And if I'm gonna do something about it, it's gotta be now. What do you mean? What are you gonna do? I'm not gonna do anything, Brian. But sometimes things happen. The house is a dangerous place for today's modern woman. Rickety staircases, faulty wiring, gay poltergeists. We widen and reveal a gay poltergeist who floats in. Boo! It's a bad outfit. The gay poltergeist shuffles away gaily. Later that day at the Griffin's house in the living room, Lois is on the couch. Peter stands in front of her. Lois, I've hired some 1980s black breakdancers to do their routine on your stomach. Peter, come on. I I'm having 
in this baby, and that's the end of it. But Lois, if they do it good enough, they'll save the rec center from being torn down and replaced by some mall. Ozone, turbo, do your thing. We reveal two black guys who train guns on Peter and Lois. Oh no, Lois, those are 90s black guys. They, are, they aren't 80s black guys at all. Run! Peter runs for the door and opens it, revealing two break dancers. We're here to dance for the kids. Run, 80s black guys. You're no match for the 90s black guys. Peter runs out. The 90s black guys run into frame shooting. The 80s black guys gasp and run out. <laughs> the Griffin's house a little bit later. In the living room, Peter holds a box that says, Acme Miscarriage Kit. He smiles confidently and looks at the camera. In the living room later, Lois enters and sees a sign that says, free Grey's Anatomy DVDs. Ow. Lois follows a trail of DVDs out the front door and up the street. Outside in a desert, Lois follows the trail of DVDs to a final DVD that rests on a circle painted on the ground. Angle on Peter up on a ledge in the distance with a huge crossbow contraption that holds an arrow with a boxing glove on the tip. He looks through the scope on the crossbow. From Peter's POV, we see Lois's midsection. Peter shoots the arrow at Lois, but it misses her and ricochets off the rock wall behind her and back up towards a huge boulder above Peter's head. The boulder starts to tilt. Peter takes out a small umbrella and opens it above his head. The boulder falls and to his surprise, it bounces off the umbrella and lands on the ground next to him. Peter sighs in relief. After a beat, there's a rumbling and the ground under him falls away. He waves sheepishly goodbye as he falls out of frame. We continue to a desert chasm. From an aerial view, we hear a descending whistle sound as Peter plummets down to the floor of the desert and lands with a puff of smoke like Wile E. Coyote. Ow. <laughs> Here we go, in the living room or at the Griffin's house later, Peter walks in carrying a bottle of Clorox. Lois, I bet I can drink more bleach than you. Okay, you know what, Peter? Just stop it. Now, I know you're not happy about this, but I am pregnant and I am having this baby. So knock it off because I've had it. No, I've had it. I don't want you pregnant. You'll be, you'll be fat and cranky and your boobs will get bigger and you'll stop having your period. Wait, how do I feel about this? <laughs> no, no, I'm against it, I say. Peter, this is important. Naomi and Dale are placing their trust in us. And besides, it, it's just nine months. And then everything will be back to normal. We interrupt this program for a breaking news story. We angle on TV to, and see Tom Tucker doing the news. A devastating pileup on I-95 has injured eight people and killed two others. Naomi and Dale Robinson were pronounced dead on arrival at Quahog Hospital. We angle on Peter and Lois, staring in shock. Oh, my God. Back on the TV. In other news, a local man has won the lottery. Lucky Quahog resident Dale Robinson has hit the... Oh, boy. <laughs> and that ends Act Two. And we're back in Act 3 at the Griffin's house in the kitchen. The family is sitting around the table. But I still just, I, I can't believe they're gone. <laughs> they have their whole lives ahead of them. Well, I'll be the one to say it. What are you going to do about the baby? Well, let's keep it and put hats on it. You know, Lewis, you're not a young woman. The odds are that baby's going to be chromosomally damaged, like, like those cats you see in the Special Animal Olympics. On TV at a racetrack, an obviously retarded cat crosses, crosses a finish line. Winning a race, a reporter approaches. So, Whiskers, how does it feel to finally win your event after years of training? Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of that. No. You're right, it's not even a joke. It's not even it's a just joke. Us, it's just being, us being bad people. <laughs> Back in the Griffin's kitchen. Why don't you just put the baby up for adoption? Well, what do we do until then? I mean, we can't afford nine months of medical bills. You could have an abortion. Well, there you go, Lois. We abort it. Send it up on up to Dale and Naomi. Yeah, they're probably waiting for it anyway. <laughs> Look, if, if they left their mittens here, you wouldn't keep them. You'd send them back. Abort the thing. <laughs> I don't know, Peter. Well, there's no harm in visiting the family planning center just to see what your options are. <sighs> God, it's such a big decision. Of course it's a big decision. Life is full of big decisions, like deciding whether or not to have Indian food. We flash back to the Griffin's living room at night. Peter sits on the couch looking at takeout menus. Lois, do I need to do anything tomorrow that doesn't involve me being bent over in excruciating pain three feet from a <laughs> toilet? No. Time for some tikka masala. <laughs> the next day at a family planning center, inside Peter and Lois talking to the doctor who sits behind his desk. Doctor, look, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a little uncertain about this. That's perfectly natural, Mrs. Griffin. And you should ask as many questions as you can before you decide. So how's it work, Doc? You strap it down and go hacking at it like Sweeney Todd? 
No, no, good Lord, this is not 2005. <laughs> We've come a long way since then. Okay, what, you, you go stabbing in there with a laser and try and zap it out like um, burning an ant with a magnifying glass? <laughs> no, no, Mr. Griffin. Well, so what, do you like hold her legs open and send a pit bull in there, one of them little rat hunting dogs, and he comes back out with it in his mouth and goes, and you know, you, you can't get it away from him because it's, it's his thing. No, Mr. Griffin, it's a very simple, safe procedure in which we very precisely and delicately remove the embryo. We do it all the time, and I promise it's virtually risk-free. Well, I have to say, I feel a little better about it. I think this may be the right thing to do. Mrs. Griffin, we have a saying around here. Let's keep abortion safe, legal, and rare. Okay, why don't you get started? I'm gonna go to the car and listen to my Eddie Arnold tape. Moments later outside the family planning center, Peter walks out, he starts toward the car, then hears some noise. He looks over and sees a crowd of people waving signs and shouting in an anti-abortion display. And what are you guys belly aching about? Sir, we are doing all that we can to stop the killing of millions of unborn babies. If you have a few moments, I'd like you to watch this video presentation. Yeah, I got a few minutes. My wife's getting an abortion. <laughs> The protester shows Peter a small TV and VCR on his table. On the screen, we see an old-fashioned health film entitled Abortion Madness. A narrator appears. Hello, friend. I hear you're contemplating having an abortion. But before you do, remember, science has proven that within hours of conception, a human fetus has started a college fund and has already made your first Mother's Day card out of macaroni and glitter. <laughs> Peter reacts, touched, as he sees an image of a fetus holding a small Mother's Day card that says, Don't kill me, I love you. Aww. But don't take my word for it, just ask my little friend Ziggy. We see Ziggy, a single cell with a smiling face. Hi, I'm Ziggy the Zygote. I'm looking forward to being an active member of your community. Can I hug you? <laughs> of course you can, Ziggy. Because even though they're not visible yet, you already have tiny arms. Arms that will one day work, play, and fold in prayer. Yay! But uh-oh, what's this? We see a sharp, foreboding hook device come into frame. It crosses behind Ziggy, then jabs him, snaring him like a fish. Peter reacts as Ziggy screams in pain and panic. Oh my <laughs> god! <laughs> Well, he's gone, just like so many other promising human lives who were probably snuffed out by abortion, like the guy who would have killed Hitler. We see a German... <laughs> we see a German man with a gun who shrugs at the camera. Nice going, Schweinhunt. <laughs> the fourth stooge. That's right, there were supposed to be four stooges. <laughs> it was gonna be hilarious. And Osama Bin Laden's America-loving older brother. I would have talked him out of it. <laughs> wow, thanks a lot for 9-11 abortion enthusiasts. <laughs> and remember, not only is abortion murder, but it's also larceny, jaywalking, and securities fraud. <laughs> and did you know that the baby you're aborting may also have a baby inside of it that you're also aborting? <laughs> now that you know this, do you want an abortion? No. No, I do not. Peter runs back into the family planning center. After a beat, he runs back out, dragging Lois by the wrist. Peter, what the hell are you doing? Have you lost your mind? Don't you worry, unborn fetus child. I am here to save you and protect you. I have seen the light. Bless you, sir. You should be very proud of yourself. Oh, I am prouder than when I was a peacock. We flash back to an office. Peter stands by a water cooler with two office workers. All of them are wearing white shirts and ties. A boss approaches. Griffin, nice work on that Anderson account. Peter says nothing, but lifts his chin slightly with a stern expression. There's a huge whoosh sound as an enormous fan of peacock feathers springs out from behind Peter. Peter stands proud and stoically preening at the others. He turns very slightly to one side and then the other so that all may admire his fantastic plumage. <laughs> Later at the Griffin's house in the living room, Brian, Stewie, Chris, and Meg are there as Peter and Lois enter. So, uh, how'd it go at the clinic? Well, fine at first, but then there was a complication. We have decided against the procedure. Really? Why? Because it's killing babies, Brian. If God wanted us to kill babies, he'd make them all Chinese girls. <laughs> all we're doing is holding a mirror up. <laughs> Peter, it's not a baby, it's a fertilized egg. It's the size of the tip of a pin. It's alive, isn't it? 
To kill any living thing is an abortion. That's what the man I just met outside the clinic told me. And he had a T-shirt on that confirmed it. Okay, well, sperm is alive, and every time you masturbate, millions of them die. So is it wrong to kill sperm? Yes. Yes, it is. From now on, no more masturbating in this house. What? Why? <laughs> because masturbation is abortion. But abortion helps me get my homework done. And, <laughs> and sometimes I abort in my sleep. What am I supposed to do about that? Peter, I'm sorry if you disagree with me, but according to the law, it is still my right to choose what I do with my body. Well, the law is wrong, Lois. Peter, if you're so pro-life, let me ask you this. Would you go down to the orphanage and claim an unwanted baby and take care of it? No, Lois, I'm here to save the unborn. Once they get out of the vagina, they can go fuck themselves. <laughs> Peter, what's inside of Lois won't be remotely human for six months. There's no brain activity until at least the 27th week. It's still a person, Brian. It's a woman's responsibility to carry it to turn. Well, what if a woman is raped? Maybe she should have thought of that before she asked me for directions. <laughs> huh? Well, now, what about incest, Peter? What's incest? You know how Cousin Lou has the kid whose eyes touch? Oh, so what? You're saying touch eyes doesn't deserve to exist? Well, you don't mind them when you want a needle threaded. <laughs> Peter, I'm just saying that they should have at least had the option. How can you say that? Think of all the love he's given to Uncle Mom and Aunt Dad. <laughs> okay, this, this argument isn't working. Peter... <laughs> the band really liked that one. Peter, what if carrying the baby to term would endanger the mother's life? I don't know what seven of those words were. <laughs> What if you look at the ultrasound and see that the baby's gonna be born with no arms and legs? You name it, Matt. <laughs> There's a beat, then Peter blankly takes out a comedy horn and honks it twice. Peter, you know what? I honestly don't care what you say. I am going back down to that clinic and I am having that abortion. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. Now, you get out of my way. Lois, you go down there and I'll blow the place up. You wouldn't. You've seen Family Guy. You know I would. <laughs> So what, you'd kill a bunch of doctors to show them that killing is wrong? Does that make any sense to you, Peter? Well... Does it? I guess not. But so, so what the hell are we gonna do, huh? I mean, well, we're not gonna solve anything by standing here screaming at each other. Look, you and I are in this together, Peter. And whatever we decide, we both have to agree that it's the right thing to do. Well, so now what? Well, I say we go upstairs, we have a long talk, and we don't come down until we've made a decision that we can both live with. All right, Lois. They both exit. The next day at the Griffin's house in the kitchen, the family sits around the table eating lunch. Well, I think we made the right decision. I mean, sure, having the baby costs a fortune. You know, there's, there's cutbacks on things we love. There's diapers and crying and late nights with no sleep. Flu shots and mumps and driver's ed and college tuition, but you know what? It's one more person to share the world with. Another little voice in the back seat of the car. Just one more Griffin to love and to love us in return. Peter turns to the camera. We had the abortion. <laughs> and that's the end of the show.